because you're jumping back into the gap. I'll let the coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Coach, I wanted to let you know the dates for the two-day BI Academy weekends have been announced. The North American event will take place in Dallas, Texas, June 6th to 7th weekend. The Europe event will take place in Antwerp, Belgium, June 13th to 14th. Please go to basketballmersion.com slash clinics to get all the details as I want to bring as many as coaches as possible together for this interactive coaching development weekend. This year, the event is open to Basketball Immersion members and non-members. The BI Academy mission is simple. Share the game, help you become a better coach. Join this amazing community experience in Dallas or Antwerp. Go to basketballimmersion.com slash clinics. Coaches, we are joined today by Kevin Eastman. Kevin has coached the game at the college and professional levels over a career spanning 35 plus years. He's a former NBA assistant coach and executive with the Boston Celtics and LA Clippers. And he's done it all in basketball from a student athlete to assistant coach, head coach, college athletic director, and now, of course, an author, corporate, and sports team speaker. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read his most recent book, which is Why the Best Are the Best 25 Words That Impact and Inspire and Define Champions, then I really encourage you to go get it and read it. And we'll talk about some of the, the things that he's learned through that book. And, uh, this podcast, Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. I have to tell you a quick story or tell our uh, listeners a quick story. My first time speaking at the Florida Clinic, and I got up super early, which I'm always a morning person. And I went to the local Starbucks near our hotel, and I thought I'd pretty much be alone in there. But of course, you beat me there. You were already there putting together your presentation and refining it as well. And, uh, you know, I, I got to think that's one of those things that's defined other people's success, your success is just that, that ability to be able to get stuff done. Yeah, well, I think for me, it's the importance of a routine, whether you are a player or you're a coach on game day, a routine is really important for you. So for me, the first, say, hour or two of my day is usually dedicated to reading, thinking, or maybe even say in that case, going over my notes one last time before I was going to speak later on that day. But it's just something that I believed in for a long, long time now and uh, something that I'll continue to do because it's been, it's been great for me. And, and I found, and I think people have to do this, what's the time of the day where your mind is the most creative, where thoughts flow a little more quickly? And for me, that's first thing in the morning. So what you saw there is, is something that happens every day, whether we're in Gainesville, Florida, or uh, where I live in Richmond, Virginia. Well, it's a great point because we glorify the morning sometimes, but it, it doesn't matter. Different people have different times of the day, and I'm glad you said that. Coach, the other thing, one of the big takeaways from a, a lot of coaches that I've talked to as we approach the 100th episode of this podcast is we're all, and this is these are your words, we're all on a seek and find mission, and the next step is to think and apply. And I believe that where a lot of coaches get bogged down is on that application side of things. Because as you know, there's almost too many ideas out there nowadays for us with access to so many different things. Can you talk about the importance of application? Yeah, I think, that, well, obviously the most important thing is to continue to seek and continue to find. But if we go back to your first question and my answer, that routine, one of the things that I spoke about in my answer was, it's an opportunity for me to just sit down with my thoughts. And now we jump to this second question and the application portion of it. But the seek and find is the most important because, you know, I've, I've often said there are two types of people out there. There's two types of coaches. There's two types of athletes. There's two types of employees. There's two types of leaders. And those are the know-it-alls who never seem to really get to where they ultimately hope they can go. And there are the learn-it-alls who may not get there as fast, but I believe they'll have a better shot at getting there. So during those morning sessions, after I have sought and I have found, then I want to think, okay, what did I hear? And for me, I have three Fs. And I believe that success leaves footprints like we've all heard, 
but what do you do with them? And for me, the three F's are you got to find them, you got to follow them, and then you've got to fit them. So maybe I found an article or I found a, a, a clinic where I could go to where someone spoke and some of the things that he or she said really resonated with me. So I found them. Then I won't stop there because I don't want to just stop learning from them on that one hit time. So I would maybe go back that night or certainly throughout the next few weeks and maybe uh, get on my computer and find out, did they give some other talks? Have they written some articles? Have they written a book? Uh, Have there been articles written on them? So that allows me to follow them and learn a little bit more from them. And then the last F is the most important one. Not everything we hear, see, pick up, or learn will actually fit us at this current time in our life or our career. So that's where you've got to really discern what can I take that I can put into what I do, but I have to spend a lot of time thinking about that because I think when these coaches, when the coaches go to clinics, they can do one of two things. Once they hear a good idea, they can either memorize it or internalize it. And if you memorize it, it's never going to come out as if it's yours, as if you believe in it. And I don't think if you just memorize it, when it gets to that moment of truth in your life or your career or a particular game, it's not going to come out naturally. So that's why I think you've got to internalize the messages that you hear and understand that you don't want to put everything you just heard into your system or your thought pattern. Because if you're changing all the time, then you really have no foundation. And that's kind of just how I believe the most successful coaches and leaders, they put a lot of thought to what they believe in and how they feel that their team or their organization should operate and how they should do it and what they should do. And then as they get a new idea that may enhance what they're currently doing, then they insert that but they don't insert every new thing that they hear. So that's, I guess, how I would answer that question. Well, that's great. Uh, just adding methodology to that with three apps, great guidance. So, you know, obviously you get asked this a lot, but uh, you know, I know you can add some insight because you've gone through this whole cycle of coaching at all these experiences, different levels, different people. So what are some things now that you would pay more attention to if you went back to coaching? Well, I, I think number one, recognition. As the leader, as the head coach, and my wife, Wendy, always used to tell me this, and I just didn't do it or believe in it because I felt I didn't need it. Although maybe I really did, but just didn't understand that I did. And by recognition, you know, when someone's doing a good job, let them know whether that's your assistant coach, a co-coach who maybe helped you get over the hump on something, but recognize people because Two things that I've found out as I'm now into my corporate speaking and having an opportunity to be around some some really good leaders in the corporate world is that they recognize their people and they also appreciate their people. So that would be number one. And that has nothing to do with what happens on the floor, although I think it has a lot to do with what what happens on the floor because it provides the, the people you're speaking to and you're recognizing and appreciating a boost of confidence you're saying to them that you value what they bring to your team or your organization. So the same thing would take place with the players. I often talk about the word truth and um, how it's so important and it's the most important word of all success. But everybody thinks that truth is always the negative things you tell people. And in fact, truth can be uh, very, very positive. Like you have recognized them, you have appreciated them. So that's number one. On the pure X and O, well, before I get to the X and O, the second thing would be I would have invested a little more time with our players off the floor to get to know them a little bit deeper, to find out really what gets them to their maximum level of energy, efficiency, and production. And also, this relationship building can build a trust. Because there's going to be times during the year where you are probably uh, going to have to be uh, maybe a little bit negative, get on a player a little bit harder than normal. And if there's a trust there and a respect there because of the relationship that has been built, I think those words that are coming out of your mouth are accepted a little bit more. And um, 
We can look to the NBA and Greg Popovich, who's known as, um, you know, not only a great coach, but also a coach that all players want to play for. And he'll get on his players really, really hard at times. But because he's built that relationship, they're willing to receive the words, however they are. There may even be a word that comes out of Pop's mouth that you might not hear often in church on Sunday. But the player's willing to accept it because they trust, because of the relationship that was built, that Pop's telling them this to help them become better that game or in their career. So that would be the the second off the floor thing. And then on the floor, I probably, number one, would have continued to do the skill development because that was really important. I I felt that uh, players oftentimes just stay the same or get a little bit worse with their skills during the course of the season because we're so used to, to doing the team stuff. So continuing to find time to work on their individual skills relative to the rules that you have at your level, the number of hours you can practice, et cetera. And then uh, I probably would have uh, watched a little bit more film, but not long duration of film. What I learned from Doc Rivers is you can watch film every day, but his rule was you got to keep it to 13 clips or less because he felt after that the players actually wanted to get on the floor. So that would have made, made us as coaches really work hard to figure out what are the best 13 clips for today. Now, I'm not advocating here that the coaches who are listening to the podcast look at film every day. That's up to them and what they believe in. But I think if you do watch film, I think sometimes you can go overboard with it to the point where the only thing you're really doing very, very well is getting your players to mentally sign out because it's too long. The other thing that I would do is not get so much angst and freak out when we only had three days to prepare for the next team. Because what I found out in the NBA is you might play the Milwaukee Bucks on on, uh, Thursday night, then you have to fly to Golden State and play them on Friday night. And you've got to be so good with your film work, so good with what you're telling that your team that Friday morning before the second game that you have to understand how important your messaging is and really tighten it up for that second game on what the NBA calls a back-to-back. But what what the NBA taught me is you don't need 27 days to prepare for your next opponent. You don't need three days to prepare for your next opponent. If you do a good job and you've taught your system well enough throughout the course of the year you can put in what the other team's going to do in a day. And you may say, well, college needs a little longer and high school needs a little longer. Well, that's all knowing what your level is and what your players can absorb and how quickly they can absorb. So those are some of the things that, that, uh, that as I think back on, I would do. And then I guess I would throw this at you. Winning a, a college basketball game or an NBA game, it's, it's not life and death. And I kind of treated it like that. And um, maybe that even hurt me going into the next game. So those are some things that I throw out there. Well, that last part's uh, obviously really important. And that seems to come with age a lot of times. I, that certainly was something that I developed a little bit more. And it relates to one thing that you've said also, which is you need to get heart space in order to get to mind space. And for me, I recently did a heart opening ceremony, which is a kind of a meditation and a ritual. But I always reflect on my coaching first saying, I'm very spiritual in the heart sense, and I didn't show it enough to my players because I was always focused on the competitive intensity. Can you talk a little bit about this heart space versus mind space? Yeah, well, in today's world, there's so much clutter. There are so many things that are occupying our mind. The demands we have at work, the demands we have at home, the meetings we have to get to, the presentations that we have to prepare for the game that we have to prepare for. Our son or daughter uh, is having a tough time with a certain part of their lives. I mean, it's just endless the number of things that are in our head. So we call that mind space, M-I-N-D. And a good leader or a good coach somehow has to figure a way to get a piece of that mind of either their player they're coaching or the employee they're leading. So how do you get into the mind and get a piece of their minds? And over the years, I've come to kind of figure out that some of the best coaches out there and some of the best leaders out there, they get to the mind by traveling through the heart. 
And by that, it gets back to what we talked about, the relationship building. You know, the more that someone can get to know, know you, the more that someone knows that you are and your heart is invested in them and their future and their career, you can get a piece of their heart space as well. And when you get a piece of someone's heart, that's usually when you have an opportunity where they'll open the door and let you into their head. But it all gets back to the relationship building. And, you know, that's why working with Doc Rivers was so good for me to observe because he was able to just consistently build a stronger relationship, maybe not on a daily basis, but certainly a weekly basis with, with, with all of our players. So, and that's one of his strengths. And at the pro level, the relationships you have with the players, that's really important to whether or not you are ever in the conversation of, of vying for a championship. It's great stuff. I'm curious with that, building the relationship. You, you mentioned Docs Rivers, how good he was. That would be something that you would have even done more of when you were back to coaching. How is that done best? Is it done through informal conversation? Is it done through formal meetings? one-on-one, where do you find that this relationship building has been the best version for you? And I think it's just, it's just little bits at a time. I don't think it has to be one uh, seven-hour meeting and you let everything out. I just think over time. Lawrence Frank, who I work with uh, and is a good friend of mine, he's now the president of basketball operations for the Los Angeles Clippers. And he had a term that he said, purposeful, accidental collisions. So you just accidentally ran into your player at the, at the water fountain. Well, you actually did it on purpose. And that gives you an opportunity maybe for three minutes to maybe tell them something they did well or something you heard that uh, maybe their brother who's in high school uh, had a great game, you know, whatever it is. But I think what you have to do when you're building relationships is make sure it's more about the other person than it is about you. So asking them questions about themselves, providing recognition for them, providing appreciation, letting them know you appreciate them, or it just could be simple stuff. Hey, did you see that game last night? And maybe they say, yeah, I saw it. And then you might say, how about that last play? And then all of a sudden, they might say, yeah, that was a great play. I said, and then you might get into, yeah, I can't believe the execution of that. And maybe it's your point guard you're talking to. And, and then you can extract a lesson, right? You can say, yeah, you know what? What I really thought was good was that point guard really calmed that team down. And, John, you, you have that same opportunity with our team, and you've done a great job of it. And I think both of us know that one game when we played uh, Memphis – Remember, things got out of whack in the, at the end. I think we both know you probably could have done that a little bit better. And then, you know, so you're kind of giving them positivity as well as maybe even teaching them a lesson. Or it simply could be something just about what's going on in their life. It has nothing to do with basketball. Or it could be that you saw them uh, say something to a player at the end of a game. And uh, you might go up and say, you know, hey, John, I saw what you did there. That was really good because I, I think it I think it pumped Bill up uh, even more and he he you can tell Bill didn't feel he played well tonight but that was a great job that you did and that's going to show up sometime somewhere during the rest of our season so I appreciate you doing that so it's a variety of things but I think I think the big thing is you can't only talk to the person when you need them that won't build a relationship. You have to talk to them when nothing is needed and sometimes ask them their opinion. I never forget early in my career when I first broke into the NBA, maybe three months in, I was still a little, you know, am I doing okay? I've not never been in the NBA. Does Doc think I'm doing a good job? So he had his administrative assistant come get me in my office because he wanted to meet with me. So Anne-Marie came and got me and and I went to Doc's office and he said, shut the door. Well, when you're first starting out and you're a rookie in a new level, which I was as an NBA coach, and the head coach says, shut the door, you know, that's one of those, oh no meetings, right? Like, oh no, I'm going to get blasted here. 
Totally. Well, it turns out, I, I actually call them oh shit meetings. Like, <laughs> oh, shit, I, I'm, I'm going to get killed here. So I walked in, he sat me down and I, he said, uh, Kevin, I need your opinion on something. So I paused and looked around the room to see like who he was talking to. And then I realized I was the only one in there. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, man, he wants my opinion. That's pretty neat. Here's this guy who's never coached at this level, and he wants my opinion. So I told you, you know, the, the oh, crap meeting, right? Well, I, I walked in there, and he said, shut the door. And I was like, oh, crap, I'm in trouble. Well, because he asked my opinion, when I left there, my chest was out, and I was like, oh, crap, this was a heck of a meeting. I'm glad I went in there. So even that, that, that's building of a relationship. That's telling the other person, I trust you. You can help, right? You can help this team. And in return, when they ask you for your help, do the same thing back. That's how these things are built. But it's incremental. Purposeful, accidental collisions. Love that. And it, what all that reminded me of, too, is one of my main takeaways from your book. And it confirmed over and over again from talking to other great leaders or people that I've been around in my life is that success is intentional and deliberate. That these moments that you're talking about, that we think sometimes just happen or they're natural, they're all they're mostly intentional and deliberate, right? That's how leaders act. Yeah, well, that's what success demands. Sustained success doesn't happen by accident. For all of the coaches or people or just corporate employees that might be listening to this, if you have a place that you want to get to in your career and your life. You can't just kind of wait around and hope it happens. You have to, like that word intentional is one of the most important words in success. You have to be intentional. Like my definition for intentional is what you do on purpose to fulfill your purpose. So if your purpose is assistant coach, what are you doing each and every day to be the best assistant coach? Because if you will do those things, you're going to get better. And if you get better, you're going to have a chance to become your best. And that's how it works. So the people who are waiting around for it are the ones who always kind of live in the world of regret, right? They they never get to where they want to go. Now, when you intentionally do something, you know, sometimes that won't be successful. And you got to be able to bounce back from that. But the two words you used, intentional and deliberate, those have to be focal points. Those have to be words that you live. Like you live those words. You don't just have them in your vocabulary. And that's the difference between successful people and people who are average or unsuccessful. They just use those words. They have them in their vocabulary. Well, successful people, they live those words. So those words shone through as I read your book. And a question popped in my head too, and I I made a note of it so that I could ask you someday, is one thing that I wanted to do better or would do better if I go back to coaching is I'd want to show more enjoyment, more outward enjoyment because I loved coaching, but there's this balance between, you know, you're supposed to be competitive. You're supposed to be this, or this, and you have to be true to yourself and your personality, but I really enjoyed what I was doing, but I wasn't showing it. I'm curious if you saw that in your study of CEOs, that they did a better job than some coach that showing that they're enjoying what they're doing. So that their employees that resonate more with the employees. Have you looked into that at all? Well, I, I've noticed it. I, I can't tell you I've studied it, but you can tell when the leader gets because usually I get introduced by the VP or the CEO. It's just that way at the conference or the their company meeting. So you can see it, you can feel it, and you can hear it how much they believe in their people and enjoy what they're doing and enjoy working at the company. A lot of people will probably say to you, if you say, well, uh, gosh, you, you got to love coaching more. They'll say, I do. Did you see me? Did you see when we upset that team yesterday? You didn't think I was enjoying it? Yeah, you love winning. But what we're saying is, do you love coaching? Because winning, you had that opportunity maybe 25 to 30, or in the case of the NBA, 82 times a year. But those every day That's why I've I've never felt like I've had a grind. Like people always say the grind of the NBA. That was was fun. And then when it became a grind is when I got out, 
right? So you don't have to just, you can't just love winning. You have to love coaching. And part of loving coaching is loving the interaction of the people that you're leading, right? Helping them to get to where they want to go, helping them to become better, helping them to do something they knew when they came in that year, they couldn't do it. But you help them get there. And you actually maybe believed in them before they even had that belief in themselves. That's what coaching can do. And I think when your team can feel it, see it, and hear it, that's when you really have a chance to have something special with your team and in that year. And it may not be you win the championship, but it may be that once that year ends, everybody knows that, gosh, we got the most out of ourselves this year. This was a fun year. This was really good. And you can win and you can compete and still have fun. You know, I think back to one of the things that, that, that I did one year when I was at a place called UNC Wilmington. We were playing at Davidson. And I remember uh, canceling practice the day before the game. And we asked to get into their pool. And in our practice gear and coaching gear, you know, going off the diving boards, players challenging coaches, you can't do a flip, you know, whatever there was, we ended up winning the next game. And I think a big part of it was just easing the tension, easing the angst, and just having some fun together on the road, both coaches and players. So uh, whether that's, uh, you know, we've played kickball before in practice, we've played wiffle ball in practice, you know, whatever it is, it can add enjoyment to what some people might call the grind. I love that. And just uh, great advice uh, from my experience that you shared some practical ideas with. And coach, I'm wondering how can we be better at holding our players accountable? That's something I get asked a lot. And I'm sure you do as well. Hey coach, going to interrupt this podcast for a brief message from show partner, Simply Safe. With home security, there's two ways you can go about protecting your home. There's the traditional way where you wait weeks for a technician to do a messy installation that costs a small fortune. Or there's the other way, Simply Safe. Simply Safe is everything you need in a home security system. It's award winning protection, two time winner of CNET Editor's Choice Award. Simply Safe blankets your whole home in safety. You get comprehensive protection for your entire home. Outdoor cameras and doorbells alert you to anyone approaching your home. Entry, motion, and glass break sensors guard inside. You barely notice it's there. But what's truly remarkable is you can set up this system all by yourself. Anyone can do it. It takes 30 minutes to an hour tops, and there's absolutely no trade-offs to your safety. You'll have an army of highly trained security experts ready to dispatch police to your home at a moment's notice 24-7. And it's only 50 cents a day with no contracts. It's why The Verge calls Simply Safe the best home security system. Go to simplysafe.com team today, and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. You've got nothing to lose. Go now and be sure you go to simplysafe.com slash team. That's simplysafe.com slash team. Well, I think that starts with the relationship because sometimes in accountability, you may have to have that hard conversation. So this word relationship, this concept of the interaction between two human beings is really important, right? And I think the biggest thing with this word accountability, because it's also asked all the time the corporate side of the speaking that I do. And um, I always say this, there is a word that has to, be, has to come before accountability or else you as a leader cannot hold your player or your employee accountable. It would just be unfair. And the way I say it is this, clarity must precede accountability. If you have not done a a good job of defining exactly what it is that you need, either your employee or your player, then I don't believe, and Doc would say the same thing, we don't have the right to hold that player accountable. So it first starts with the clear definition of their role. And then once that happens, if they're not living up to that role, if your relationship is strong enough, you can have a truthful conversation. Now, the player may not like it as you're having the conversation. But just like that Popovich and Tim Duncan example, you know, if he gets on Tim really hard, maybe even uh, says some words that we shouldn't say, when Tim leaves that conversation, he may not like 
how it was said, but he understands what was said was for Tim's best interests. And that's why Tim was, was so good for the, the organization. He would take anything Pop would throw at him. But as a leader, you can't be afraid to hold your people accountable. And that may sound silly and funny, but a lot of leaders are afraid of that confrontation. Because it's easy to hold them accountable if you can do it like, uh, hey, you just got to just gotta do this a little better. We won by 28 today, but if you can just do this a little better, uh, it's going to help us in the tight games. Well, that's a lot different than a, than a guy dribbling 25 times and the shot clock goes off and he had a chance to shoot a layup and we lost by one. That conversation might be a little different. Might be a little harder. Right? Might be a little more intense. But if you have the relationship beforehand, you shouldn't. You can't control how they feel about what you say, but you have to say it because you're the leader. Now, how you say it, you can control that, but you can't always tr- control how it's accepted and received. So, but it's your responsibility as a leader to, if things aren't going well or they're not, they're not uh, playing up to the, the level of their role that was clearly defined for them, you have to let them know. And maybe the next day you come back and say, hey, because I've done this before. Hey, you know, that conversation we had, it was a little intense. I'll give you that. It was a little hard. And I know you probably didn't enjoy listening, but I do hope that you got the message. So, and then the last thing I'll say on that is it depends on who you're talking to. I always use J.J. Reddick because J.J. was so tough-minded, like words just bounced off him. You could get on him very, 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 very hard. And he would just walk away and say, I got you, coach. I'll do that. Well, with some of our other players, you couldn't do that. So how you send those accountability messages are really important. No question in terms of that. And it leads me to uh, another part that uh, I think is a great insight for coaches you to comment on. is uh, Why is pause one of the best words you can have in coaching? Yeah, because it's a word I never had in my vocabulary when I was coaching. Basketball is a fast-moving game. And the crowds are right there with you in many gyms and arenas. And you can feel the energy. And, and with energy comes emotion. And sometimes with emotion, when it gets too much emotion, it becomes emotional. right? And we used to always tell our players, look, we want you to play with emotion. But you can't tip it over into the into an emotional state play with emotion but never get emotional because when you get emotional that's when you lose focus you lose discipline and you probably say or do some things that you shouldn't so in my readings many years ago uh, I, I, I came across something that said you just had to slow down when you get in those situations so my thought was you know I don't want to use two words there what's a what's the single word so just when you know you're you're about to go off, let's say. If you could somehow train yourself to just say the word pause, just pause for a second. And if you can, quickly run through these things, uh, these questions. Do I need to say this? Second question, do I need to say this now? And then the third question would be, does it need to be said by me? Maybe I can tell one of my assistants, hey, can you tell John he's got to do a better job in whatever, blocking out. But that saves me maybe a zing or a bullet at that particular player. So I just think when we, get, when we know we're getting a little revved up, if we can just have that word come front of mind, that word pause, maybe it'll keep us from doing or saying something that we regret the next day. You know, I, I often get asked uh, at the end of a game, when you go into the locker room, Doc must have some great messages, whether you win or lose. What does he say in there? How long does he talk? And I would say Doc's average post-game talk was maybe a minute and three seconds, if that. And the reason was this. He never wanted to have to apologize tomorrow for something he said last night. So if we lost, hey guys, we all know we didn't play well. Let's bring it in. 
or, hey, guys, the, the plane's leaving at 10 o'clock. Great game. We'll go over the film tomorrow. Bring it in. So in essence, what he was doing, he was pausing. Let's watch the film. Let's get away from the emotion of the game. Let's pause a little bit. And then we'll go over tomorrow. And that was an unbelievable lesson that I learned. I wish I would have done that more. Oh, it's a great lesson. And uh, it, it obviously applies to sending emails when you're angry. And, and to me, it also applies to coaching interventions because clearly coaches tend to talk too much in practice as well. So just that word pause in the back of your mind, being conscious of that can help you, again, be more effective. Coach. Coach, yeah, no question. What yeah, is a I would also throw out this, Chris. Uh, you know, if coaches can get into the mindset of teaching in bullets, not paragraphs, know your system, know your philosophy, know your terminology so well that you don't, you shouldn't have to take 75 words to explain something. As Doc used to always say, hey, our corrections, I want, I want you guys in and out. If you have to talk with like three or four or five or six or seven sentences, then we got to know our stuff better. We have to be able to send our messages in bursts, in bullet points, not paragraphs. Well, I love that. And you're the master of the bullet point for sure. And uh, So many of them I've remembered because of the way that you presented them in a meaningful, concise way. So it's great. Uh, Coach, let's put on, go, go back to where, again, a lot of your success started with player development and skill development and all the things that you brought to the table with that. And uh, one of your quotes, repetition will create skills. Commitment to detail will produce great skill. Yeah, yeah. Because to me, repetition is, is what creates a habit. And a habit is something you need in, in times of stress, in times of challenges, in times of issues, or as we used to say with our teams, in the moment of truth in a game. As the SEALs often say, in tough times, you sink to the level of your habits. Now, if your habits are good, you don't sink at all. If your habits are bad, you are going to sink. So the SEALs don't believe you rise to the occasion. They believe you actually uh, sink or dip to the level of your habits. And habits are formed through your repetitions. And think about what they have to go through. Think about that the Bin Laden raid. They better have had great habits because that helicopter went down. And if you talk to any of them, and I happen to know one of them who was involved in that raid, he will say, we didn't rise to any occasion. We just relied on our habits that we drilled and we talked about and we diagrammed the house that we were going to go into. And we knew their, their idiosyncrasies when they were inside that house. We knew if windows were a certain place, that meant this type of room, all those things. You sink to the level of your habits. And if your habits are good, you don't sink at all. So repetition is so important. And as I often say to, to players when I speak to teams and do my sports team speaking, I'll say, how many of you in this room want a good reputation? They all raise their hand. So I'll repeat it. I'll say, so you want a good rep, right? They all shake their head yes. And I say, well, let me, let me get you to understand this. You get your rep through your reps. You get your reputation through your repetitions. And then I go on to explain that as you repeat, repeat a specific skill, and hopefully you're repeating it in the right way, fundamentally the right way, you get a little bit better at it. And when you get a little bit better at it, people start to notice. And when people start to notice, you want to keep it up. So you keep working on that habit. And as you keep working on it, you get even better. And now even more people know. So you get your reputation at its core through your repetitions. So I believe it's just so important that if we want to be successful at anything, like when I gave my very first corporate speech, once I left the NBA, I went back to my coaching days and I said, okay, how did we get teams prepared? Well, in training camp and preseason, we would practice two times a day. So I practiced my first talk two times per day for the first 20 days. So that gave me 40 reps of my talk. And then the last 10 days before, I had it down pretty well, but I practiced it one time each day. 
So I actually had given my first talk 50 times before I gave my first talk. Repetition is so important because repetition gives you confidence, right? And confidence, I think, allows you to be less stressed once you're in the action, in the fray. Taking that to another level then with all your experiences in the NBA, personally, beyond repetition, what are some other things that make a good workout or keys to a good workout? Well, I, I think uh, you have to practice at a rate equal to or faster than that, which will occur in a game. Now, I don't mean you go crazy fast, but it may be in a shooting drills, the balls are coming at you a little bit faster each time, Right. So that, that's, that's what I mean by that. I think the types of drills you do, I think knowing where the athlete is on that particular skill. Let's say you have an athlete and you're working them out during the course of the year and they go into a shooting slump, right? So in particular, you got to know that athlete. Okay, how do we get them back to shooting the ball well? If I ask players what they do in a shooting slump, they all say the same thing. I get in the gym and I take more shots and get my shot back. Well, that I would tell them that's great, but let me just tell you what Ray Allen, one of the best shooters, what he did when he was in a shooting slump. You see, because what he did, getting a lot of shots was third on his list. The first thing he did was he, he tried to evaluate his shot selection. Maybe the shots he was taking was causing him to miss. Maybe he was taking them uh, too highly contested. Maybe he was taking them off balance. Maybe he was taking them too fast. So he would evaluate his shot selection. The second thing he evaluated was his feet. Because all the really good shooters at the highest levels will tell you the quality of their feet usually determines the quality of their shot. Because their quality of their feet allows them to start the upward movement on balance. So Ray would actually do a drill where we didn't even have a ball. And he would just fake and then cut to somewhere on the court we would pretend to throw him a ball and all he would do is pretend to catch it and square his feet up just to get his feet back, like remind his head that his feet needed to be right. So, and remind his shot that the feet needed to be right and remind the feet that they were the start of the shot. And then he went and took more shots. So there's just, you know, it just really to me depends on the player. And where is he or she in their development? And how hard do I push? What's their mental makeup like? Can I push him hard? Can I push her harder? These are all things that would go into how long would I go with that particular player that particular day? Because I always went into skill development with a a clear-cut plan for each and every player. And I always kept it in the the back of my uh, gym trunks. And we would just go down whatever it was we were working on that day. Coach, curious as you're, you're talking there about, you know, your experience as an executive involved in player development, assistant coach at the NBA level. Curious about reverse engineering an NBA player back to college, back to high school, knowing when you saw them first come into the NBA, what were some of the biggest things that they weren't able to do yet that we could have developed better, say, in college or we could develop better in high school? Do you have some thoughts on that? after being, again, at that level in those different roles? Well, the first thing I would say, well, actually, there's, I don't know the order just yet. Let me just fire them out because I haven't thought of it uh, relative to this particular question. But routine would be number one. Start to get into a game day routine and a practice routine. And that, that, that means what you do before, what you do after, you're stretching, whatever it is. That would be number one. Number two, start to pay attention to the details a little earlier in your career. Uh, number three, I would probably add some defensive skill development uh, into, into some workouts, just some concepts that as they keep climbing up the ladder and go to new levels, they have to master these things. Now colleges are teaching the pick and roll details, pick and roll defensive details much better than they were when I first got into the NBA because what we found with rookies coming in is they really didn't know the entire package that goes with defending an NBA pick and roll and everything involved in it. So I would add some defensive things. 
in that as, as well. I would also add some film work because as you go up higher, you're probably going to watch a little more film and film becomes important. And it may not be you watch it as a team when you're in the NBA, because I said 13 clips with Doc, but you're going to watch with an assistant coach another 13 clips just on your game. And you may even watch it on the bench if you, after you get done your pregame shooting routine before you go back into the locker room. So that would be important. I would really work on the mental side of the game. Like if a player misses uh, nine shots in a row in a shooting drill and kind of goes off or kicks the ball, hey, hey, hey no, 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 let's figure this thing out here. Let's work on this. This is an area of improvement for you that if you don't get this right, it's going to affect even the skill that we're working on. So those would be some things that pop into my head. But the mental side is becoming more and more a part of our game. Like, how do you deal with failure? How do you deal with mistakes? How do you deal with embarrassment? How do you deal with all this stuff going on in the Twitter world? Because how you feel in your mental and your mindset that day or that game ultimately will have a bearing at some point during that day or that game. I'm glad you said that last part about the, particularly the integration of mental skills and coping strategies, I think is really an untapped area where we do not spend enough time as coaches finding experts if we're not experts to be able to help players. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And some of that goes back to the relationship thing too. The stronger the relationship, the more you may find out about that player. They may tell you, and and if the relationship is strong, they're probably going to tell you some things they may not tell others. And some of those things that they tell you may be able to help them and help you as you try and create that personalized plan to get that player from spot A to spot B to spot C and and so on down the alphabet. So I think that's, I, I just think that the mind is more a part of the game than it was maybe even 10 years ago. So we pay attention to it a lot in the NBA. I'll tell you that. Where's their confidence level? Where's their motivation level? Where's their mind today? And sometimes they won't tell you. So that's why you got to be keen on their body language and how they're walking that day. Even, you know, are their shoulders slumped? Are they walking in a real slow gait? Are they not talking to anybody today when normally they're, the life of the team. So I think we've got to be more observant today. Maybe again, for the fan and me a little bit, but can, can you reflect back on those Boston Celtic years? Uh, obviously tremendous players, tremendous talent, tremendous coaching staff as well. Do you reflect back and ever think about what was the biggest, say basketball, technical, tactical impact that is still lasting from that group? Because you guys seem to be very innovative, especially on the end, uh, you know, driven by personnel. But uh, do you ever reflect on that and have some thoughts on that? Yeah. I, well, first thing, driven by personnel, a lot of people are going to uh, equate that with talent. And if that's what they do, then, then I would say, no, we were not driven by personnel. We were driven by mindset. We wanted to get the right types of players that had the mindset to, to actually compete at a championship level. Because sometimes what that means is you're going to go through some rough spots and you may have a hard truth said to you. So you have to have be of the right mind to understand what it takes to actually go through a year and win a championship. And then we believed in simplicity. Maybe at the time when we won it in 2008, the NBA, the standard NBA team might even play a pick and roll six different ways. We did not. We played them two different ways. That's it. And we challenged our guys to be the best in those two ways because then we took the thinking out of it. You know, Daryl Royal, who was a uh, really good football coach at the University of Texas many, many decades ago, in his book, he makes a statement that stuck with me forever. A hesitant athlete is a non-athlete. And uh, we wanted our guys to play not think and play. Now, on the other end of the floor, we did have to think a little bit in terms of shot selection and and time on the clock and all that sort of stuff on the offensive end. But on the defensive end, we, we wanted that to be all about energy and simplicity, as well as communication. 
So that was a big part of why we were able to do what we were able to do. And then the other part of it was uh, our culture was built in and around the word truth. You could tell a hard truth to a teammate, but you, they, our guys also understood you have to receive that hard truth. And what we found with that particular team is nothing was ever taken personally. And that may sound like a simple statement, but for teams that win championships, for the most part during the course of the year, nothing's personal. It's just, okay, we're out here in a competitive environment. Something might be said, boom. Now, could that happen a couple of times? Sure, in the course of 82 games and you're with your team 250 days that year, but they get over it. And it, the intent was not personal. And we used to always, we were very careful. You know, like a Kevin Garnett, he may make three mistakes in a row, but if his intent was right and the execution was wrong, you can live with that. His intent was right. He was trying to, he was trying to win the game. He was trying to help our team. The intent was right. Someone who might, whose intention might be to selfishly not do something because they were lazy and didn't feel like doing it or it was too hard. That intent is a losing intent. So there were so many things beyond X's and O's that were really important to us. And I believe that helped us choose the players that we chose to go after the players we went after and ultimately to win the championship that we competed for. Coach, let's, uh, let's, let's focus a little bit on uh, I think the big picture uh, question as we start to wrap this up. And you say, what is a three-dimensional look at success? I think that's an important thing that you've shared with coaches to be able to understand and, and, and value success beyond, again, j- just a financial return or a win. You talk about three-dimensional look at success? The three-dimensional look at success? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Well, this was also a big part of, of who we were and, and why we won. And I, I just termed it the three-dimensional look at success. And it goes like this. You have to learn from the past, you have to produce in the present, and you have to prepare for the future. If your team or your company or you as an individual can do those three things each and every day, you got a shot to becoming the best that you can become. And by learn from the past, I mean, look, just learn from the past. Don't live in the past. Whether you had a great quarter or second quarter in the corporate world, or you just made uh, six shots in a row in the first half, don't live there because what you're going to find out is someone's going to knock you down if your mind is always back there. Learn from it. What did you do to have that great Q1, Q2? What did you do to actually get open to make those shots, right? And continue to try and do those things. Or if you've had some failures or made some mistakes, what did you do that caused those? And try not to do that again. So you got to learn from the past. you got to produce in the present. That's all about your role, your role on the team, whether that team be corporate, whether that team be athletic. What is your role? Because your role is the value you bring to that organization or that team. Do that to the best of your ability. As Doc used to say, be an all-star at your role. If you do that, you're going to have a nice career. And then you got to prepare for the future. And part of preparation for the future is what you learned from yesterday, what you actually do, are doing today, because that will tell you what you need to do a little bit better for tomorrow, right? So if we can live in three days, there's three really important days on the calendar, only three. And those are yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what yesterday is about is uh, evaluation and education. What did we do and what did we learn? What today is about is execution. Okay, we learned from yesterday. Let's execute the corrections today. Let's execute our role today. And then tomorrow, again, gets back to that word preparation, right? Because pretty soon, if we don't prepare for tomorrow, then tomorrow becomes today and we're not going to be ready for today. So, in a nutshell, that's what that three dimensional look at success is all about. Love it. Love it. And uh, love the book, Coach. I can't thank you enough for sharing that and, and all you do for growing the game of basketball. Why the best are the best coaches. You can find it on Amazon or go to kevinisman.net. 
to be able to check into that and then all the information about coach and uh, where he's speaking. If you ever have an opportunity to bring him in to speak, it's uh, tremendous as well. So, coach, thanks for taking the time and sharing the game. No, I appreciate it, Chris. Keep it up. Things like these, you know, I, I certainly learn from them when I hear other people on podcasts. And I know you get some great guests. So keep it up and keep sharing all the wisdom. Appreciate it. Thanks. Coach, now's the time. If you are not yet a member of basketballmersion.com and our membership community, join today. I want to read one testimonial to you from a coach who had tremendous success over his time as a Basketball Immersion member. He recently sent me this email. Shout out to Chris Oliver and the Basketball Immersion community. Our small high school had gotten to one provincial final from the school's opening in 1978. I took over the girls program in 2011. Since joining Basketball Immersion in 2016, we have been to three finals in five years, and tonight we won the first high school basketball title in school history. So many people are a part of making it happen, but zero seconds training and basketball immersion and many of the basketball immersion principles have become a big part of our program. Thanks for all you do and all your ongoing support. Coach, it's time. If you're not yet a member, join basketballimmersion.com today and get your coaching stimulated. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.